Tony Hawk's Pro Skater left a huge impact on the gaming world when it first arrived in 1999. And in the 20 plus years since its arrival, the series has had its share of ups and downs. But now, Tony Hawk is back. For real this time. I'll just say it straight up. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 is one of the best Hawk games ever made. The development team absolutely nailed it. But the road to this new game was long and rather interesting. Today then, I want to take you on a journey through the first two games in the series to demonstrate how it has changed over time while highlighting both what makes these games so timeless and why this remake delivers. We'll check out nearly every version of the first two games as we slowly make our way to the current day. Curious how N64, PlayStation, and Dreamcast stack up? How have the stages evolved over the years? And where did it even come from? And if you're just here for information on the new game, go ahead and skip ahead in the video and that's where you'll find all the typical Digital Foundry information. But if you want to better appreciate what they've achieved, I recommend sticking around. All that and more is coming up on this episode of DF Retro EX. Looking back, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater seems like a case of right place, right time. Skateboarding and the culture around it was blowing up in the 90s, and Tony Hawk himself would go on to become one of the most well-known skaters in the world, building a bridge that would grab the attention of skaters and non-skaters alike. But the road to this game was anything but simple. The studio behind Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, then, is Neversoft, started in California all the way back in 1994. Founded by members previously of Malibu Interactive, a studio that had worked on numerous 16-bit games under the Malibu Comics brand, Neversoft managed to snag a contract early on to work with Playmates Interactive, the games division of Playmates Toys. They were tasked with developing a new game based on the Skeleton Warriors property. Skeleton Warriors first launched for Sega Saturn in 1995, with a port arriving for the PlayStation just a year later. It's an interesting, if somewhat flawed, side-scrolling action game. Its standout technical feature is the frame rate. It delivers a smooth 60 frames per second while drawing a mix of 2D sprite-based characters done up in a pre-rendered visual style, along with 3D polygonal backgrounds. It's not great, but technically it's a great starting point for the studio. From there, two new projects would be worked on, a Ghost Rider game that would be published by Crystal Dynamics and a first-party Sony published game known as Big Guns, or Exodus in its later years. Both would be cancelled before completion. So things weren't exactly going well then, but the team did manage to score another contract with Playmates. The opportunity to port Shiny Entertainment's exceptional MDK from the PC to the PlayStation. Of course, the MDK engine itself isn't well suited to the system, so Neversoft used its own technology to bring the game over to Sony's machine. It's a rather different looking iteration of MDK as a result, and it does have some performance issues, but it's a reasonably solid conversion that demonstrated Neversoft's technical talents. But it just so happened that all this technology would wind up proving highly valuable for the future of Neversoft, as you'd expect. You see, in 1998, the team met with Activision to discuss the Apocalypse Project, an internal game that had been in development hell for years. Neversoft took over the game and managed to quickly deliver it, saving the title from limbo in the process. It's a decent twin-stick shooter featuring the voice of Bruce Willis, but this title would become critical to Neversoft's future. You see, their excellent work on saving this project gave Activision the confidence to ask them to build something else, something new, a skateboarding game. In 1998, skateboarding video games were really starting to become popular once again. While stuff like Skate or Die had existed in the past, it was new titles such as Sega's Top Skater that really changed the game. That combination of music, speed, and skating was very appealing, and Activision naturally wanted to give it a shot. To cut a long story short then, the team jumped into this project wholeheartedly and managed to produce the original Tony Hawk's Pro Skater in just a year. And it was a massive hit. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater offers a perfect blend of addictive score attack gameplay, exploration, and a strong presentation that keeps you playing. 
It brings together various elements of gaming's past into one singular, wholesome experience. There's basically three elements here that really jump out to me. First, the score angle. Like classic arcade games, Tony Hawk rewards skilled play with a higher score. Finding the right paths to execute huge combos is key to success, and it pushes you to keep playing, going for the top score. In 1999, this style of play wasn't exactly popular, but it is what defined arcades of the 80s. Tony Hawk offered a fresh take on the concept. Then there's the exploration element. In a way, it almost scratches the same itch as a platform game. You slowly but surely uncover secret areas, new routes, and the best places to combo. Just existing in these environments skating around is engaging and they're a lot of fun to explore. Both of these tie into the pinball angle. You see, like classic video game pinball titles like Devil Crash, you work your way slowly through less common areas of the world slash playfield. That feeling of reaching and staying at the top is addictive both in these pinball games and in Tony Hawk. You get the same buzz when skating around these hard to reach areas. The core game loop then is enhanced by the skating atmosphere. The combination of music and visual design just felt cool and very authentic. And all of it was made possible by Neversoft's evolving technology, which proved capable of supporting relatively large open maps with non-linear exploration. Using the CD-ROM format to its fullest, Neversoft even managed to include video billboards that would play as you skate, along with a soundtrack made up of real bands. The limitations are certainly clear, however. Draw distance is limited with fog. Large surfaces exhibit severe affine texture warp, and the frame rate is often rather unsteady, but still, it managed to work. So yeah, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for PlayStation was a huge deal. And with its success, it should come as no surprise that Activision wanted to bring the game elsewhere. While Neversoft itself would begin work on a sequel, Activision drafted other studios into reworking the game for different consoles. The first port arrived less than six months later for Nintendo 64. Developed by Edge of Reality, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for the N64 offers a surprisingly solid version of the skateboarding experience with numerous improvements over the original version contrasted against a few drawbacks. On the positive side, the N64's hardware features enable cleaner, smoother visuals, textures are now filtered and perspective correct. The system's hardware anti-aliasing cleans up edges, and the frame rate is, shockingly, much smoother. Smoother than most N64 games, anyways. This is perhaps the most surprising element, as PlayStation to N64 ports often suffered in this area. Not here, though. Tony Hawk delivers a nearly rock-solid 30 frames per second, which is a huge upgrade over the PlayStation original. In researching the game, it also became clear that they switched from integer math to floating point math, which is what allowed for increased precision with less visible errors in displaying animation and polygon models. But perhaps what's most surprising is that the N64 manages to play very well. Unlike your typical title for the system, Pro Skater uses the D-pad along with the C buttons to emulate the PlayStation version's controls. The close proximity of these buttons combined with the solid D-pad design allow for a very smooth playing experience. I was able to jump right in and start executing tricks without issue. Compared to the PlayStation version, the assets are all virtually unchanged, with differences stemming from the hardware features inherent to the system. However, the color schemes have been modified slightly. The sky gradient in the school, for instance, is a lighter tone on Nintendo's system. There are caveats, however. Firstly, the video billboards, and in fact all video content, has been eliminated. This is understandable considering the cartridge size limitations. These videos are not critical to gameplay, so it wouldn't have made sense to take the Resident Evil 2 approach and shell out for an exceptionally large cartridge while dedicating the engineering time necessary to make it work in the first place. More disappointingly though, the music itself has been hugely pared back. Each track has been truncated and edited to work within the constraints of the system. That means lyrics are often eliminated or reduced, and previously two-minute-plus songs have become short loops. 
The quality of the playback is also reduced, but this is kind of expected given the nature of the platform. This doesn't ruin the game by any means, but music is a huge part of the Tony Hawk experience, so it feels somewhat diminished in this form. Still, overall, the N64 version is an excellent iteration of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater that looks and plays better than the PlayStation release. The next version, however, was something rather different. In partnership with Natsume, Tony Hawk made his first appearance on Game Boy Color. This is effectively an entirely different game with the Tony Hawk name slapped on the box, but that's not necessarily a bad thing as the Game Boy Color could not possibly reproduce Tony Hawk in 3D. But what we did get here isn't exactly thrilling. It's basically a series of half-pipe minigames played from the side view perspective alongside some overhead sections. It's competent enough, but it feels more like an 80s microcomputer take on skateboarding than something from the year 2000. Still, while it's simple, it's not necessarily a bad game. It just serves as a reminder of how different things were at the time. But this was also when a proper conversion for Sega's ill-fated Dreamcast was in the works. Announced in early 2000, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for Dreamcast was first revealed with these shots. They look great, right? Unfortunately, and I don't know the full story here, these shots definitely do not represent what would finally ship. The final game instead looks like this. But still, despite the obvious difference, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on Dreamcast is solid. The project was handled by Treyarch, who would eventually become a huge part of the Call of Duty franchise, but at this point in time was finishing up Draconis Cult of the Worm for Dreamcast first. A second team was splintered off to build this new Dreamcast version of Tony Hawk. Curiously, this version was published by Crave under license from Activision, so it wasn't a direct Activision published release. Now, when development first kicked off, the original idea was to implement online play in this version, but Sega's network would not be ready on time, so it was scrapped. In the end, the team built a new renderer that took better advantage of the Dreamcast hardware. It now runs at a full 640x480 in progressive scan at a rock solid 30 frames per second. According to the game's post-mortem, the team did investigate going up to 60 frames per second, but time constraints made this virtually impossible, and thus 30 FPS was settled on. Ultimately, from what I gather, the short development time and slow communication between Treyarch and Neversoft, as they had to go through both Crave and Activision, most likely prevented this game from becoming anything other than an enhancement of the original release, and honestly, that's just fine in this case. The increased resolution and smoother performance alone helps tremendously, but there are numerous other enhancements as well. One of the largest changes, visually, centers around the shadows. By rendering everything around the player using two passes, one for geometry and another for the shadows, it became possible to accurately map the shadow texture across surfaces in the game. It bends and moves realistically across the world. The PlayStation version uses a simplified method that often clips through the scenery in comparison. Other changes include an increased draw distance. The fog is still present, of course, but players can now see much further across the stage, making it easier to line up tricks. The textures were also greatly enhanced with higher resolution artwork in certain cases, along with high quality bilinear texture filtering and mip mapping. In some areas, new objects such as bushes were added to the mix, increasing the perception of scenery detail. So while it's clearly derived from the PlayStation original, the quality of the rendering is greatly enhanced. It's just a smoother looking game all around. Thankfully, the Dreamcast version retains the original soundtrack and even the video billboards, which again, according to the game's post-mortem, were difficult to implement as the libraries necessary for streaming video to textures weren't ready yet while they were in mid-development. A beta version of this got them to the finish line. Without a doubt, this is my favorite version of the original Pro Skater, and in fact the first version that I ever played. But it wasn't the final release of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. But that comes later. First, just four months after the launch of the Dreamcast version of Tony Hawk 1, Neversoft returned with a full-on sequel. This is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, one of the greatest sequels of all time. It arrived on September 20th, 2000, just a month before the release of PlayStation 2 in North America. But it didn't matter. The Birdman had staying power. 
Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 offers a slew of key improvements to the game that forever changed the series. The most important is, of course, the introduction of the manual, basically a move that allows you to pop the front or back of your board in the air while riding across flat terrain. It works as a combo linker, allowing you to chain together huge sequences of tricks. This is the move that changed the way tricks work in the series, a move only rivaled by the revert that would be introduced in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Some would argue it's too much, but I think it adds a lot to the game. Of course, there's more to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 than just this singular move. It's a late generation PlayStation game after all, and offers numerous technical improvements over its predecessor. The maps are larger and more detailed, the colors more vibrant, and each of the skaters looks a lot nicer. Plus, the camera work is better and there's more features than ever. The whole thing just feels more fleshed out. It's still Tony Hawk, but it's just a flat out better game, at least to my tastes. Activision knew it would be huge, and thus they ensured that an entire fleet of ports would be ready to launch quickly after the PlayStation original. And the first port was released for the PC, that's right, coming to us from LTI Grey Matter, the PC version of Tony Hawk 2 is the very first port of the game, and it's not bad, but it's also not great. It supports high resolution output, of course, and 3D cards of the time, allowing for perspective correct textures with filtering, but it also exhibits many of the same flaws as the original PlayStation release. Shaky animation, a limited draw distance, lots of fog, low resolution assets galore, and more. It feels like a half step between the PlayStation and Dreamcast release. This is especially evident in the UI, which relies on poorly scaled fonts contrasted against a few updated assets here and there. The frame rate is also capped at just 30 frames per second. There are patches to unlock the frame rate, add widescreen support and the like, but this is how it was when it first launched in the year 2000. In this instance, we're looking at the game running on a Pentium 3 with a Voodoo 2 card installed, and it's clearly little more than a basic PlayStation to PC conversion. But the PC release does have an interesting international iteration in South Korea. The specific version includes members of the K-pop group Finn KL along with some of their music. Now it's otherwise the same as the western release, but it's not exactly something you would have expected, but it is kind of neat. Not long after this PC release however, Activision published two additional versions of the game, another Game Boy Color conversion from Natsume and a Sega Dreamcast release. That's right, Activision itself published the game on Dreamcast this time around. So let's start with that version. Despite releasing the original game on Sega's system back in May, Treyarch immediately jumped into the sequel and had it ready for launch in November. They certainly work fast. And it's an excellent port. Treyarch expanded upon the work they did for the original Hawk and managed to improve the sequel in numerous ways. It looks, runs, and plays better than ever. The team touched up the visuals compared to the PC and PlayStation version. The character models, for instance, all received a generous boost in polygon count and texture quality, while environmental textures have been mildly updated as well. The draw distance is pushed out, color gradients are smoother, and everything just feels more solid. The same shadow technique used in the original Dreamcast release also makes a return and looks better than both the PC and PlayStation versions. Unfortunately, like the Windows port, the frame rate is capped at just 30 frames per second, but at least it's rock solid. This version also received improved video playback. The various movie files are all displayed at a higher resolution and frame rate compared to the PlayStation release. So yeah, it's an excellent port and one that I spent hundreds of hours playing back in the day. Even the Dreamcast controller wasn't an issue for me. The normally mediocre D-pad works shockingly well with this game. All in all, Treyarch did an excellent job. Now the other version released in November of 2000 is completely different of course, it's the Game Boy Color version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. Natsume is still involved, but this time the game itself has evolved. Stages are now derived from the original release and are presented in a side-scrolling format with multi-directional input. This channels the essence of Hawk more accurately than the original Game Boy game and plays much better as a result. It's about the best you could expect from a Game Boy Color, and honestly, it works pretty well. 
The next port, however, wouldn't arrive until the following summer, and for good reason. It was a launch title for Game Boy Advance. That's right, it's another portable game. Developed by Vicarious Visions, which would go on to lead development on the brand new version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, the GBA version marks the team's first encounter with the series, and shockingly, it is remarkable. The Game Boy Advance naturally could not support a fully 3D game, at least one with the complexity of Tony Hawk, and thus the decision was made to deliver an isometric iteration of the game. All of the game's levels were recreated in this style, while characters are rendered using simple polygon models. Everything runs at a super smooth 60 frames per second, and controls are simplified to support the limited control options on the Game Boy Advance itself. It takes a while to get your bearings, of course, but this was an exceptional achievement for the time. It really did offer a portable Tony Hawk experience in a way that the Game Boy Color really could not and its release would go on to define the future of Vicarious Visions in many ways. Now around the same time, a Macintosh version of Pro Skater 2 was also released, but it's simply derived from the PC port, so not especially interesting. Next up though is Edge of Reality's second conversion for Nintendo 64. This release inherits many of the features included in the original and stands as one of the better ports of the game, like the first, it takes advantage of the N64 hardware to deliver perspective-correct filtered textures, anti-aliased edges, and smoother overall visuals. The frame rate is also much more consistent than PlayStation, and in some ways I think it looks even better than the PC release on a 3DFX card. It's a solid version of Pro Skater 2, and it even features a new level in addition to every other option from the PlayStation version. Unfortunately, there's still a downside. The soundtrack situation is even worse this time around, with a huge hit to the number of tracks in the game, and the tracks that are in there are massively cut down. Now, it's not a deal breaker per se, but it's definitely not optimal. Now at this point, most versions of Tony Hawk 2 have only offered modern enhancements, but this next release is a little different. This is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X for the original Xbox, which released alongside the console in the fall of 2001. Activision contracted Treyarch to build this version of the game for Xbox, as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 wouldn't be ready in time for the North American launch, and they wanted to have Hawk available for new Xbox customers. This version is a huge upgrade visually. It's almost more of a remaster than just a port, in fact. The renderer was reworked to take full advantage of the Xbox hardware, while the frame rate was bumped up to a full 60 FPS. And on top of all that, it's packed with extra content. The assets were almost entirely remade from scratch, often using photographs from nearby locations to create them. The textures themselves are much higher resolution than the original, taking full advantage of the extra VRAM available on Xbox. A new sky system was also developed with moving clouds added to the mix, while background elements around all the stages have received a boost in detail as well. Perhaps the most famous improvement though stems from the grass. Using a multi-layered texture trick of sorts, fields of grass now feature actual blades of grass as opposed to a single flat textured surface. This technique would become popular in time and is often called fur shading, but it was still very new in 2001 and it definitely left an impression. Other details include enhanced shadows for characters and an accumulation motion blur on the skaters as you pull off tricks. In addition, the image quality is exceptionally clean with minimal shimmering and aliasing. It really showcases what the Xbox can do on this front. It even includes some new maps, though honestly, they're not exactly well balanced, but it's still a nice bonus. The Xbox version includes system link multiplayer options for up to four players, along with an expanded soundtrack, and even the option to use your own soundtrack if you choose. And all of this is topped off with a fully revamped menu system with all new artwork. So yeah, for the time, this was the ultimate version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. The only real issue you could level at this game is the Duke controller itself that released with the Xbox. It never really felt right for Tony Hawk, but hey, at least the controller S improves upon that. 
So at this point, the series would continue to move forward with brand new installments from Neversoft, but this was not the end for these original games. In 2003, Nokia launched the N-Gage, and IdeaWorks 3D was there with ports of Tomb Raider and the original Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. While it's certainly rough to behold now, it was a relatively impressive game for 2003. This was well before the launch of PSP and Nintendo DS after all, so portable 3D gaming wasn't exactly a thing. Now I don't own an Edgage myself, but Robert from Windy Corner TV was nice enough to film his copy of the game running on an N-Gage. In addition, friend of the show Audie Surly also managed to dig up the original press kit, which included this direct feed capture as well. Cool stuff, right? So yeah, it's not my preferred version of the game, but it's still impressive that it exists at all. It would later see release on normal Symbian phones as well, in 2005. An iOS version of Tony Hawk 2 also arrived in 2010, but it's since been delisted and no longer runs on modern iOS devices, at least not on my iPhone 11. Now after this, the original two games would disappear into the ether for years before making a partial return in 2012's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD. This version of the game, built by Robomoto, features a mix of stages from the first two Hawk titles and is built using Unreal Engine 3. Now, it's not a bad game by any means, and the visuals are reasonably nice, but something about the handling always missed the mark. The controls, physics, and skate lines are all different, and the pace of the game just feels sluggish. The package is also relatively bare bones and really doesn't feel like a proper Tony Hawk experience. In that sense, this feels more like a clone of the game rather than an authentic Tony Hawk experience. In addition, the original PS3 and 360 versions are capped at 30 frames per second, but we're looking at the PC version here, which is much improved. It's fair to say that this release was not exactly well received, and it marked a downward spiral for the series that would culminate with the abysmal Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, a game which we thought may have ended the series forever. Which, of course, is not the case. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 has arrived from Vicarious Visions, and it's one of the best reimagining efforts I've ever played. On the surface, it feels perfect. The team worked from Neversoft's original codebase to nail the handling while carefully designing the new maps to perfectly replicate the original skating lines. As a result, it feels authentic while rivaling many other games of 2020 in terms of visual fidelity. This version sees release across multiple consoles on day one. All variations of PlayStation 4 and Xbox One are included, along with the PC version that unfortunately only exists on the Epic Game Store right now. Since this is a new game, however, we should probably talk some of those Digital Foundry style numbers. So let's consider this. The original Pro Skater games on PlayStation and N64, I suppose, run at 320 by 240, right? This was upgraded to 640x480 for Xbox and Dreamcast, though later Xbox ports supported 720p as well. Then Tony Hawk HD arrived in 2012, and that was 1280x720 on Xbox 360 and PS3. So what about Tony Hawk 1 and 2? Well, the pixel count increases by as much as 4x, depending on the console. Xbox One X, for instance, runs at a solid 1440p. The same is true of PS4 Pro, though it does seem to use dynamic resolution scaling, reducing that resolution to just above 1080p at points. Both feature a glorious full native 4K UI, however, which looks excellent. The PS4 then runs at 1080p, but can drop to 864p in demanding circumstances, while Xbox One S seems to vary between 720 and 900p. Despite this significant variation resolution, however, Unreal's excellent TAA means this is the cleanest looking game in the series to date, no matter which platform you're playing on. More importantly, it includes a world-class HDR implementation with excellent calibration options. Now, while the console versions look great, it's the PC version that perhaps impresses the most. As mentioned earlier, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 on the PC was kind of a bare-bones port, but this new game has received a proper PC conversion. This means things like a full options menu with lots of available adjustments, including support for high refresh rates and ultra-wide displays. Arbitrary frame rates are also available, so if you have a high refresh rate monitor or a high-end CRT, you can push that up even further. 
The combination of a higher frame rate and ultra wide support definitely opens up the game and makes it feel even better than it does on the consoles. Now it uses all the same assets as the console versions of course, which is not a bad thing, but the extra options available on PC allow you to push out the fidelity even further and it just looks glorious. Even the interface takes the PC into account. You can navigate all of the menus with the mouse or a gamepad, and it switches button prompts back and forth between gamepad and keyboard, depending on which one you've used last. It happens instantly. Still, no matter which version you choose, the boost in detail is unmistakable. Remaking classic maps is no easy task, but the developers have managed to perfectly capture the atmosphere and feeling of those original levels while massively boosting overall detail. New lighting conditions, physically based materials, reflections galore, loads of extra detail and more help bring the maps to life. They're instantly recognizable, yet somehow feel more like real places now as a result of this boost in quality. I really can't say enough good things about the quality of the work on display here. Of course, I'm equally impressed by the reworking of the characters. The proportions now feel more natural, animation is more realistic, and the camera work really opens up the map. You simply have this increased awareness of everything going on around you that makes it easier to execute combos. The menu itself then presents each game as its own collection of stages, and unlike HD, it includes every map from Tony Hawk 1 and 2. Of course, they're all remade entirely from scratch. There are some really nice quality of life improvements as well for anyone playing Tony Hawk. For instance, when you fall off, the game uses this digital glitch effect to reset your character almost immediately and get you back on your board rather quickly. The way the momentum is maintained after bailing really helps keep you going. Loading times are also quick, at least as fast as the original, which is extremely important for a game like this where you will likely be retrying regularly. What makes this better, however, is that the soundtrack continues to play even when restarting a map. In the original games, pausing then restarting would switch to a new song each time, which was frustrating as sometimes you'd only hear the first few seconds of a track before retrying due to an early mistake. Here, the music plays regardless. You can also skip tracks now by clicking the R3 button at any point while also customizing your playlist in the options menu. You can even update your skater stats mid-game and have them take effect immediately. Now in a more controversial move I suppose, the game includes things like the revert from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 by default, and this naturally has an impact on the scores you can attain. It isn't the same as the original titles. But thankfully for purists, it is possible to limit your moveset to either Pro Skater 1 or 2 if you want that old school style. The point is, the entire user experience just feels really well thought out. It's exactly what a Tony Hawk game should be in 2020. It keeps what was great about the original games, but introduces a much cleaner design, faster loading, and tons of quality of life changes on top of the gameplay perfection. I'm not joking when I say that this game moved me at an emotional level. Experiencing the gameplay again on these brand new maps, reborn at this quality, it really is a magical thing. Now, the real cherry on top, though, is the frame rate. After the PS2 era, the latter-day Hawk games all started exhibiting severe frame rate difficulties or just went for a lower frame rate. Tony Hawk 1 and 2, however, brings us back to a full-on 60 frames per second on every single console. Whether you're using a basic Xbox One or something like a PS4 Pro, Xbox One X, or a PC, the frame rate is fantastic. Well, nearly. You might notice a hiccup or two on the base consoles and some of the busier maps, but this was also true of the original titles. This section here in New York was pretty much the worst that I encountered, and it was especially bad on Xbox One S, but by and large, it's very stable. The PS4 Pro and Xbox One X in particular basically never drop frames. It's very, very stable. After playing through the original PlayStation releases again, which barely hit 30 frames per second, this new version felt just perfect. And in fact, it does run better than the Xbox version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X, making this the smoothest running version of these games to date. By and large, it's just about as perfect a frame rate as you could ask for in this day and age, and that helps tremendously with playability. 
I think it's pretty clear then that I'm very happy with this new version of the game, and it's precisely why I felt the need to walk back through the history of these titles. It's rare for a remake to nail the overall feeling of the original so well, while still improving upon virtually every other element. As far as I'm concerned, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 is the best game Activision has published this entire generation, and one of the best games ever made, I might argue. That speaks to both the work that Vicarious Visions poured into this version of the game, but also to the quality of the original Neversoft games. It really is that good. I haven't felt this engaged with a new Tony Hawk game since Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. But that brings us nearly to the end. Hopefully you've enjoyed this journey through the ages, from the humble beginnings of Neversoft in their early days with Bruce Willis, to the early, almost surprising success of those original games, to the fall of the series in its later years, and its rise once again with the latest iteration. There's been so many different versions of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater released over the years, so which ones are your favorites? For me, the sweet spot will always be Tony Hawk 2 and 3. Hopefully we'll see a remake of 3 and 4 down the line. Honestly though, it's hard to go wrong with any of the earlier games, and I didn't even touch on some of the more advanced features such as the create a park mode and the multiplayer, which are also amazing additions. The point is, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater is a series that is near and dear to my heart, and I'm thrilled to see it return so strongly after faltering for so many years. But that's going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, as always, be sure to let me know. Follow us on Twitter, ring the notification bell, you know the drill. And until next time, stay retro.